of promise. And you see, I'm already distracted. So let's go to our session for this time, which is number five in our series, Don't Be Afraid. And I want to read you just some familiar verses to tell you once again that you don't need to be afraid, and most of all, you don't need to be afraid of God. As you see in the notes for this time, there is such a thing as theophobia, the fear of God. And we can have a little talk, especially in our question and question times at the end. Uh, that, you notice I didn't say question and answers. Uh, when we can talk about the fear of the Lord, and what that might really mean. I want to remind you, though, of Luke chapter 2. The shepherds, verse 8, were there staying in the fields, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. And you can perhaps understand why. The appearance of God of the angels, of the heavenly host. All this brings fear to us. We're afraid of it. And what did the angel of the Lord say? The angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Don't be afraid. In fact, if you go through Scripture, Go through the Old Testament. When God appears, that's one of the first things that He starts saying. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to fear Me. You don't need to be terrified of Me. Jesus does the same thing. Here's an example in Mark chapter 6. After He leaves the disciples to go over the lake, later on, He catches up with them. The interesting thing, of course, is that he's having to catch up with them by walking on water. So when they see him walking on the water, Mark 6 and verse 49, they cry out in terror, thinking he's a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. Jesus spoke to them at once. And what did he say? Don't. Be afraid. Don't be afraid. In fact, the very first book that I put out was called that. Well, they changed the title to Fear Not, Why Not? But the original working title was Don't Be Afraid. Stepping through Scripture, looking at all the times that God tells us that we don't need to be afraid of Him. But I would suggest to you this evening that if God appeared here right among us, in all His glory, we'd all be flat on our faces, wouldn't we? Because the glory of the Lord is that awesome, brilliant power. And God would have to say to us exactly those same things. Don't be afraid. You don't need to fear Me. You don't need to be terrified of me. Have you been afraid in your life? We've all experienced fear, haven't we? Here's an illustration for you. One that I cannot tell in many places because most people wouldn't understand and relate to this, but I know that here in South Africa I can do it because it, it's a cricket analogy. And I do notice from spending a little time here and putting the TV on that there is a certain preoccupation with things that have to do with cricket. Now, if I had to explain this in some other parts of the world, it would just go right over their heads. But you probably have played a little bit of cricket, maybe. You've certainly seen cricket. <clears throat> this is at school in England, the Southern Grammar School for Boys in Portsmouth. That's where I went to school. Back in the days when boys and girls went to separate schools and everything else like that, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I will not debate here and now. But we had a cricket team. <clears throat> and we played the other schools in the area. I used to play cricket with my brother in the garden, and that was just usually an affair with a tennis ball. 
and that's not so bad. You know, you can toss it up and it spins around a little bit, but it's not particularly dangerous. Plus, it doesn't get you into so much trouble with your parents when you smack a cricket ball through the window, stuff like that. I became interested in doing a little more, so I signed up to be part of the cricket team, uh, but when they saw me play, they said, well, you can be the scorer. So I was the scorer, and I went to the matches, and I scored, and everything else like that. One day, this fateful day, I was there, ready to score, but we had only 10 players. So guess what? I get to play. Now, I could bowl a little bit. I think I could at least say that. But to bat... Not so much. So they put me in at number 11, obviously. Our wickets were lost quite frequently, and we were not doing well. <clears throat> Eventually, I had that long, slow march out to the crease. Somehow, they saw me coming. It was like, a lamb to the slaughter, I think. And they put on their tallest, fastest bowler. And he came up and he whizzed this thing straight down at me. And I was in abject terror. Absolutely terrified. If you've ever been hit by a cricket ball traveling at speed, it is extremely painful. And he just seemed to take great delight. And I completely missed it, and thankfully it missed my stumps too. And he just grinned at me. The next delivery was a bouncer. You know what a bouncer is. See, I don't have to explain these things here. Isn't that great? And this went flying over my head. If it hit me, it probably would have taken me off to hospital. The third one came, and I'm waiting for it, and I am really by this time. You know, my bat is shaking, and my knees are knocking, and, I, and it just comes straight through my garden, uproots my middle stump, and that's it. I go back. I am just so, so relieved as I walk back that I'm not injured or even dead or something. The fear, at least, is gone. And, of course, my companions chide me a little for not putting up more of a defense, but I was just wiping the sweat from my brow, having been absolutely terrified. Can you relate to that? An experience of being totally terrified. I remember another time from my childhood when there was some boy on the way to school who took a delight in trying to bully me. And I really did not like walking to school anymore because he'd always try and come up and threaten me and try and punch me and everything else like that. And, you know, I had been brought up in a good Christian home not to try and thump him back. Uh, but I wasn't quite ready to turn the other cheek either. And so I remember growing up <clears throat> with that experience of fear as well. Fear is a normal and natural experience, emotion in our life here on planet Earth. It's a result, a consequence of the cosmic conflict. Because of what's gone wrong, and we've seen some of that in our discussions already. We've seen how the accuser has misrepresented God, made him out to be somebody who is cruel and hostile, unforgiving, severe, and somebody to be feared. And then sometimes we read these things too, don't we? Are we not supposed to fear God? Some of you may say. What about some texts? Could you think of some? I think if we can all think of one at least. The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. So we should be scared of God so we get wise, right? 
Is that what it's saying? As somebody once said to me, well, the fear of the Lord may be the beginning of wisdom, but it's certainly not the end of wisdom. I quite like that idea. Are we supposed to be frightened by God? Especially when every time He comes, like the angels came, like Jesus came, He's saying, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be frightened. Often people have said that religion is based on fear. And I have to say that for some religions, that does seem to be true, doesn't it? You fear God. You fear your parents. You fear your religious instructors. You fear all these people who seem to have power over you. And sometimes, yes, it's true that the promoters, the purveyors of religion use fear because it's a useful thing to have. If I can scare you enough that you'll give better offerings, make sure you come to church, I'm going to tell you that if you don't come to church and if you don't do all these things, then you're going to burn. Don't you feel fear? And don't you want to do everything you should? And I have to say that in the Old Testament, you even see God doing those kinds of things, I believe, to get attention. Just so that the people would be there sit still long enough that they will listen. <clears throat> so, for example, if some of you here are feeling a little, I don't know, mellow, enjoying life, quite happy with things as they are, if I start shouting, then you're all awake. And what's going on? And what did he say? What was that all about? It gets your attention, doesn't it? Is everybody listening now? <laughs> Sorry, up in the, uh, in the booth there, all the, all the equipment's blown now. <laughs> I do that for effect because I think God does that sometimes. Not to really terrify us because he wants to scare us, but to get our attention. Those people at the foot of Mount Sinai who really weren't paying attention, he makes that mountain smoke and quake, and it is so terrifying. They all say to Moses, you go and talk to God, because if he talks to us, he's going to kill us. They are absolutely terrified. And they say, everything the Lord says we will do. What is prompting them to do that? Isn't it because they're absolutely terrified of God? Do you think God is happy to scare people like that? Or does He do it for a reason? I was reminded today of uh, an experience with my son when he was about two years old. That's quite a while ago now. We were out for a walk in the beauty of a spring morning there in England and we'd seen the buttercups and the bluebells and the primroses and you know and he was here hearing the birds singing he was enjoying this as we walked around this along this lovely little country path and we came to the end of the path and the path ran out to that point and there was a road that crossed and he was quite a way ahead of me and he's running along running along running along doesn't really notice that the path has finished and he's out in the middle of the road at that point as a loving father, well, what would you do? You'd be reasonable, wouldn't you? You would say something like this, Paul, you are in the middle of the road right now. This is not a good place for you to be. It's not healthy. A car or a lorry may come along any moment and wipe you out, but... You know, it's your choice. I would sincerely invite you to return to the curb so that life may continue 
and things may be good for you. I could say it like that, couldn't I? Or I could shout, get out of the road! Sorry, I'm doing a lot of shouting tonight, aren't I? But that's what you'd have to do, wouldn't you? And maybe you'd run over and grab him by the scruff of the neck and drag him back. And he's going, what, what, what happened? And maybe he's terrified that his loving father has turned into this terrible ogre. But you do it because you love someone. Because it's an emergency. <clears throat> Something you have to take, off, take care of very quickly and very dramatically. And then you do a little bit of explaining, even at two years old, you sort of say, Paul, see that? Car whistles past. See that? A lorry goes flying by. And if you were out there, it would not be good for you. I think that's the sort of thing that we're dealing with here when we talk about fearing God. Certainly the Israelites did fear Him. <clears throat> Rightly so. Time and time again, he has to do things really to get their attention and to get their, at least, obedience. Do as you say. Do as God says. And this is what we might call servant talk. A servant doesn't ask why. He just says, what do I have to do? Just like those children of Israel. Interesting, they're called children, isn't it? The children of Israel. When they say, yes, everything the Lord says we will do. Because they've been scared into obedience. But that obedience lasts as long as what? As long as the fear does. As soon as they don't really feel frightened anymore, and Moses has been gone a long time, they go over to Aaron. What do they say? This fellow Moses has been gone a long time. We want you to make us an image of the God who's brought us out of Egypt. And so Aaron makes them this golden calf. And the Lord must have been saying, What? And he tells Moses, you better get down there double quick because things are not good in the camp. And when Moses goes down and sees what's going on, he even breaks those stone tablets of the Ten Commandments because he's horrified at what they're doing. Because they're not frightened into obedience anymore. You see, that's the problem when you use fear as a motivator. It lasts, your obedience lasts as long as the fear does. Whereas what God really wants to do, once He's got your attention, is to talk to you. Remember Elijah was there hiding in the cave, totally lost it, depressed, whatever you want to say. And God appears in the earthquake. No, He's not actually there in the earthquake. And then there's the wind. But no, He's not there in the wind. And he's not there in that roaring fire either. Where is God? You remember that story? In the still, small voice. That quiet whisper of saying, let's talk together. Let us reason together. Once he had Elijah's attention by those very dramatic demonstrations of earthquake, wind, and fire, then they could talk. I know that in my own life, God has had to shock me into sitting down and saying, Lord, okay, I'm ready to listen now. I need to be there and I, I will sit down and I will hear what you have to say. Most of us are rushing around. Busy, busy lives. So much to do. There's, there's too much to do in our lives today, isn't there? We have to go here and do that and then the... You know, we have to take our children to this thing and then there's that thing and you know, we've got to deal with Aunt Martha and Grandma and everything else that's happening in our lives. We hardly have a spare moment and sometimes God has to say, stop. you just got to stop. We need to talk about things. We need to have that relationship. So when God does shock us, 
use some of these techniques that we've just been talking about, we shouldn't then conclude that God wants us to be terrified of Him. Because if we are terrified of God, then what? If we're terrified of God, we might listen, but we would not love. Can you truly love somebody that you're terrified of? No. So, if your understanding of the fear of the Lord is to be afraid, go back and go through Scripture. I'm not going to do it for you here. You go back and read every time that God says, don't be afraid. Fear not. You don't need to be frightened of me. And you say, but you're the almighty God. Yes, I am but I'm not hostile towards you. I love you and I care for you and you don't need to be afraid of me because perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. If we think God is a punitive God coming to punish us, then we will fear Him and we will not love Him. That's the bottom line for tonight. A few more thoughts. Here from Isaiah 54.14. God makes this promise to his people. Tyranny will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed. It will not come near you. In the age of the terrorist, the age of terror, these are wonderfully reassuring words. And they should reassure us that God does not want to terrorize us. Terror will be far removed. It will not come near you. You will have nothing to fear. And I want to finish with John 14. Because here Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples. To you and to me. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be upset. Don't be worried. Don't be fearful. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In fact, the Greek words there can be translated as either trust as a command or the indicative you are trusting. So you could write, you could interpret this as you are trusting in God and so you are trusting in me or you could mix the two. I like it when to, to interpret this and to translate this as you are trusting in God so trust also in me. Trust in me in the same way that you trust in God. In verse 27, I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. And I want to add Jesus is also saying, you don't need to be afraid of me or of my Father. Because if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Are we afraid of Jesus? Anybody here? If I ask the same question, are you afraid of God? Maybe there would be something a little different. But if we've seen the true nature of God in Jesus then why should we be afraid? Certainly, we should not be afraid of God. All right, we'll take some questions now. All right, uh, I'd like to invite anybody with a question, come forward. Um, and while you're thinking of your questions, I have a quick question for you. The concept Make sure it's a really difficult and complicated one. Well, I was thinking of uh, <laughs> doing a tug um, badge for the person who gets it. Tug being trip up Gallagher. All right. Um, that will be interesting. But Are you going to do a little button that you could put on? Yeah, I'll put a little button. But, <laughs> you know, knowing you, you just ask a question back again, and that would defeat the object. The question I want to ask is, is fear synonymous with sin? Synonymous. Is it the same as? Or is it a direct result of? I think, as we saw, as we talked about the fall of Adam and Eve, you remember, Andre, 
the very first thing that Adam and Eve did after they sinned was what? They ran and hid. Why? Why would you run and hide? Because they were afraid of God. In fact, that's what they tell him when he says, why did you hide? It, we, well, we heard you coming and we were afraid. The very first person to f be feared in the universe is, is God. So I think sin certainly does have that immediate effect. It's not necessarily the same as, but it certainly has that consequence that we're afraid. Because we feel guilty and we worry what God is going to do to us, and therefore we fear because fear has to do with punishment. And we expect to be punished. Would I then be right in saying that the less I fear, the better my relationship? Well, certainly in terms of our relationship with God, um, and maybe you should think about this on the personal level with our relationships. Um, maybe I won't go in and ask each husband and each wife, whether you fear each other. <laughs> uh, we don't want to get any, any uh, comments that might not be helpful here. But really? I don't think we fear one another, do we? I hope not. Not at that very intimate level. So I think you're right. Uh, we don't. As the more that we learn to love one another, the less we fear. Yes. Uh, good evening. Andrew Mason. Good um, to see you again, Andrew. If we look at God's dealings with the Israelites, can we say that he was successful? Mm -hmm. um, because you're talking about uh, fear, you know, we needing to transcend that and move towards a relationship with God. But if we look at God's track record and God being all-knowing and all-wise, and we look at the, his track record with the Israelites, was he successful? Mm, that's a good question. Was he uh, successful in his dealings with the, the Israelites? especially in terms of fear, uh, did it really work? Hmm. Sometimes they did what they were told, but then they went off and did their own thing, and then they had to be dragged back, sometimes you might say kicking and screaming, and uh, they were under the discipline of God. And then they come back and they're very sorry and everything else like that because they realize they've done the wrong thing and they're frightened of what might happen. And then they go off again. So it's backwards and forwards, this oscillating, vacillating between two positions until in the end God has to say, okay, you're going to go into exile. And he tells Jeremiah to tell the people, just accept it. And they do. They have to. Got to they don't have a choice. So, so they go into exile. After the exile, what then? They're so horrified and terrified that this might happen again that they kind of set down all the laws, all the laws, because they are scared of going wrong again. And it leads them to that situation that Jesus finds when he comes, which is of people who are just doing it because they have to. And because they're frightened of the consequences. So I think you would have to say that the use of discipline and fear and all those other things as motivators doesn't really work in the long term. Because you, what you're really looking for is a relationship that is based on love, respect, admiration, and fundamentally agreement that you agree with God that His ways are fundamentally right. So I hope that starts asking, yeah. answering the question. Sorry, just a quick follow-up question yeah. then. Um, do you think God then, would you say God then, much like human parents, was learning with His uh, dealings with the Israelites? Then is, I mean, if you think about God, um, it, did He need to learn? <laughs> well, I'm not sure that we can say that God learned in the same way that we needed to learn. But he experienced the things in the same way in real time, could you say, as the Israelites did. And he's not sort of saying, I don't think we can say, well, God says, well, that was a mistake. Um, humanly speaking, though, I suppose that's the kind of thing that comes across when you, you read 
the story of the flood, it says that God says, oh, I wish I'd never bothered. And you say, but didn't you know it was going to work out like that? And the answer is, yes, he did in his foreknowledge. But he speaks our language. So I think perhaps uh, insofar as that's our language, we could see God dealing with the Israelites and, and, and with us in the same kind of developmental way. And the way that God relates to me now, I'm sure, is different to the way he related when I was younger. And that's because I hope I've learned something. Not necessarily that God has had to learn anything as, a, uh, as part of that process. I don't seem to see any other questions coming up, but I have a question for you. Ah, there's one coming now. Okay. If I read my Bible and it says, fear God and give glory to Him, is there a word I can substitute for fear so that it's more understandable in the mm -hmm. English language? Good. Thank you for that. Um, in the Greek, it's... Phobos, fear. And that is used for this whole wide range of emotions in which we could also say things like awe and respect, as well as literally fear and, and terror. In fact, the word is used, and you're going to have to translate it according to, to context. So I would, I would often want to say things like, um, instead of terror or fear or being afraid, is respect or honor. Uh, words like that which show that you are very much aware of God as He truly is, as sovereign of the universe. But He is the one who says you don't have to be afraid in the sense of being terrified. I think when we read the things like fear God and give glory to Him or uh, the, big, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it's recognizing that what He says is the right thing and agreeing with Him. Um, because if we're just terrified, we're not really thinking anyway. 